So let's start with the first period and a very good marker to notice uh, for this period is the US National Environmental Policy Act from 1969. And one of the things that it does is implementing uh, the tool for uh, assessing environmental impact. So is telling the federal government that environmental impact assessment should be carried out when different projects are being created. And also what is interesting is creating uh, the Council for Environmental Quality um, in the administration in the US. And what it state there is quite interesting because it says each member shall be a person who as a result of his training experience and attainment is exceptionally well qualified to analyze and interpret environmental trend and information of all kinds. There is something interesting here because no one is actually capable of fulfilling this. You can't be an expert in toxicology and at the same time in the impact of a uh, ecosystem on different aspects of chemical pollutants. There is no one who can do that alone because environmental problems are interdisciplinary. However, there is this expectation and notice that there is assumption that the such expert exists. We can also see the uh, importance of information within the Rio Declaration of 1972. If you recall, that's the UN conference, first conference on environment and development. And it's calling for uh, the connection to the public and that is important to see what they are asking for. So they are recognizing the need of mass media to communicate and disseminate information uh, in order to educate people. So something that it's about sharing information and educating people about environmental information. But then between experts, they are talking about free flow of up-to-date scientific information and transfer of experience must be supported and assisted between different nations. So there is a difference between the public and the uh, experts. And shortly after the Stockholm conference, they created the first environmental information system at the global level, which was called InfoTerra. It was a mainframe based directory environment of environmental expertise used by national nodes. So it was run as a system that includes all sort of uh, data, but basically not the data itself, but more of the names and the details of who you can contact about it. So the c in this time, the storage is a very expensive. The operations are also complex and the query, just running a query on the system might have cost a few hundred dollars. By a decade later, in 1982, there was already excitement about the potential of geographical information and how it can be used. So they were talking about creating a global geographical information system that will uh, capture information about the environment and they were talking about a UN system designed to convert environmental data into information usable by decision making and uh, talking about sharing all this information electronically across the globe, which was um, a bit of a dream at that time because the internet and the ability to send fa uh, rapidly large amounts of data emerge only a decade later. So if we want to summarize this first era of information, first of all, there is what's called the information deficit model towards the public. If we will tell them what we know about the environment, they will change their uh, action and practice. And what we need to share with them is this basic information. There is a top-down attitude to environmental decision-making 
and we can say that what is seen in this period is that environmental information is produced by expert in order to be used by expert. So in other words, if we want to look at it, we can see that the expert are the one who may be discussed or may be, be in a conflict with each other. You know, they might be uh, discussing different things and then the, uh, they discuss with decision making but if the public have an issue, they should talk with the decision maker. The experts are out of the equation in this case.